welcome back to this uh, short series of presentations, talks on how to parameterize and choose and fit copulas. We've talked a little bit about how to choose a copula using a top-down approach. Um, things like looking at how much confidence you've got in the assumptions that you're using, like correlations, uh, looking at things like tail dependence and how important tail dependence is and, and what the actual tail dependence is for your data. What we're going to look at now is a couple of ways that you can actually parameterize copulas. So parameterization is actually the final point in the top-down approach. You've, you've chosen your copula, you've already decided what the copula is, and now you want to actually fit your data to it to work out what the parameter should be. Um, but it could also be regarded as the starting point in the bottom-up approach, depending on how you do it. Because once you've found some parameters and you've actually got a, um, a, a fit for your copula, only then can you start to work out whether that copula is a good fit or not. Now, again, there's, there's two broad approaches that you can use to fit a copula. There's the method of moments and the method of maximum likelihood. Um, and for each of these, you probably come across them in terms of trying to fit data to a statistical distribution. And it's exactly the same principle. It's just it's a little bit more complicated because you're working in terms of copulas and they're a little unfamiliar. But conceptually, it's, it can be even easier. So the method of moments for distributions, let's, let's just go back and use this as an example. It's a common approach for parameterizing distributions, for working out what the parameters are. Um, a simple example here uh, is the gamma distribution. So say you've got some data which you think follows a gamma distribution and you know that the mean of that data is 20, the variance is 200. The gamma distribution under uh, the parameterization we're using, it's got a couple of parameters, beta and gamma. You know that the mean is beta gamma and the variance is beta squared gamma. So E of x, beta gamma is 20, you know that. E of x squared, which is beta squared gamma plus beta gamma all squared, so you're adding the mean squared back to the variance. That's equal to 200 plus 20 squared is equal to 600. And then, uh, I avoided putting the boring bits in here, but you can set these up as simultaneous equations. You've got two unknowns, two equations, and if you do a bit of playing around, you can get beta equals 10 and gamma equals 2, the method of moments. The method of moments for Archimedean copulas is probably even a little bit easier because most Archimedean copulas, um, at least the ones you most like to come into contact with, they've only got one parameter. Um, and the parameter is um, linked to a coefficient, co correlation coefficient. So for, for Gumbel and Clayton and for using tau, uh, Kendall's tau as your correlation coefficient, is really very straightforward. So we know that for the Gumbel copula, Kendall's tau is equal to 1 minus 1 over alpha, where alpha is the parameter in your copula. For the Clayton copula, it's alpha over alpha plus 2. Um, the Frank copula, it's complicated. Um, for Clayton for Spearman's row, it's also complicated. And Gumbel, Spearman's row, it's, there, there's no closed form. So even more complicated. So what you need to do is you need to find Kendall's tau. Now, I did cover rank correlation coefficients a little bit in the uh, last uh, lecture I did almost two years ago. Um, and what I'm going to do is just dive into that in a little bit more detail uh, this time. So rank correlations are an alternative to the traditional measure of correlation. So, you know, if you put in equals correl in your Excel spreadsheet, what you're actually concentrate, uh, calculating is, is Pearson's row, Pearson's product moment correlation coefficient. Essentially, you calculate the covariance between a couple of um, items of data, and you divide that by the standard deviation of one and the standard deviation of the other, and you get the correlation coefficient. Now, rank correlation coefficients are calculated using the order of the observations, so, so the values don't really matter. And the two most common are Spearman's row and Kendall's tau. So this is just going back to the example I, I used um, in the previous presentation. You've got two normally distributed data sets here. Pearson's row is 0.74, Spearman's row is 0.709, Kendall's tau is 
if you decide that actually Y isn't normally distributed, it's now got fat tails. So you just stretch it a bit. Um, but you keep the order of the observations the same. What you find is that Pearson's row changes because um, your covariances and your standard deviations change. But Spearman's row and Kendall's tau, because they're rank correlation coefficients, they don't change. And if you change the uh, observations for y and x again and you make them uniform so you stretch them so that they all they, they both go from zero to one in a uniform way well spearman's row and kendall's tower remain exactly the same what's interesting though is that pearson's row is exactly the same as Spears, spearman's row so one way of calculating spearman's row is you simply turn all your data into a uniform distribution i mean even just rank the data and if you work out the correlation coefficient between the ranks then you come up with Spearman's row, which is useful to know. Not that useful because we need Kendall's tau, but it's, it's still potentially useful to know. So calculating tau and Spearman's row, um, as I've said, you can just use Pearson's row to uh, on, on the ranks and that'll give the answer. There's also a formula for Spearman's row and it is actually pretty easy. So what we've got here is um, a couple of data sets, xi and yi, um, and we've got them there in the second and the fourth columns. Um, the third and the fifth columns give us the ranks of those observations. The next column then just looks at the difference between those ranks. So 10 minus 9 is 1, 9 minus 10 is minus 1, 8 minus 5 is 3, and so on. So you take all those differences, di, you square them all, add um, those squares together, multiply by 6, divide by n brackets n minus 1, so n to the total number of observations, which is 10 here, then do 1 minus that, that gives you Spearman's rank correlation coefficient. So it's a pretty easy formula to plug things into. Kendall's tau is not easy. I mean, conceptually it's easy, but it is a pain in the neck to calculate because you need to have lots of data items. So it, because it's a rank correlation coefficient, again, you start with the ranks. So in columns 2 and 3 here, again, we've got the ranks for X and Y. And we've got the differences there in the next column. Then what you need to say is, is the difference between those positive or negative in each case? Then for each, well, I'm going to call them cells. So cell 1, uh, which has um, ranks 10 and 9. Cell 2, ranks 9 and 10. You compare the signs of those differences. Now, if they are both the same, so they're both positive, that means that you've got something, you've got a couple of pairs which are concordant, because what it means is that if, if x goes up, then y goes up. If x goes down, y goes down. So they're concordant. If one is positive and one is negative, then they're discordant. If x goes up, y goes down. If x goes down, y goes up. So they're discordant. So what you want to then do is to compare each pair of cells and see whether they're concordant or discordant. So you look at cell 1, which is positive, and you compare it with 2, then with 3, then with 4, all the way down to 10. Then you take cell 2, and you don't need to compare it with 1 because you've done that already, so you compare it with 3 to 4, 5, etc. So that's cell 3, and so on. Now what that means is you've got to do um, a half n, n minus 1 comparisons. So you've got 10 um, cells here, so that means 45 comparisons. If you've got... Um, 100 cells, 100 items of data, then that means you're looking at um, around 5,000 comparisons. If you've got 1,000, then you're looking at about half a million. So it is a pain in the neck to calculate. But once you've done that, it's pretty straightforward. You just total up the number of concordant pairs and the number of discordant pairs you've got. And tau is then simply um, concordant minus discordant over concordant plus discordant. So conceptually it's easy, in practice it's not so easy. So return to the method of moment for copulas. You see it's simple to rearrange alpha in terms of t. So um, in the second column here we've got what uh, tau is in terms of um, alpha. So you just rearrange it and you get alpha in terms of tau. And we know from the data before that tau is 0.511. And what that means is for the Gumbel copula, alpha is 2.045, and for the Clayton pop, uh, copula, alpha is 2.091. So it's, it's, it's a pretty easy calculation. Now we can 
parameterize a Gaussian copula using method of moments as well. And all we need to do is to use the correlations. But it's important to use the correct correlations. Um, as a starting point, you could just use Pearson's row calculated between the transformed variables, which is going to be different to the Pearson's row calculated based on the raw data. Um, what you'd need to do is to resize the um, data that you've got into a normal distribution so that whatever the distribution it had before, the altered uh, data has a normal distribution, and then calculate the correlations between those. But even here there's a few caveats, and I'll talk about those in, in a little while. More broadly, if you're looking at elliptical copulas, then it's a bit harder because um, you've also got to work out what the um, degrees of freedom for a T copula is, and, and the correlations between the transformed data are going to change depending on what those degrees of freedoms are. So you might have to calculate rows separately for each degrees of freedom. But there's a broader issue with method of moments for any elliptical copula, including the Gaussian copula, and that is that you've no way of knowing how far away from the, the true correlations are the correlations that you've calculated. And the, the idea behind this is you've only got a sample of the data when you're calculating the correlations. You've only got the data which um, has happened in the sample period that you're looking at. So it's only a sample of the data. And your correlation coefficients that you're calculating are essentially sample correlation coefficients. Now, how close are those to the true underlying correlation coefficients? It's quite difficult to work that out unless you use um, fairly involved uh, mathematics. So if you do want to use some fairly involved mathematics, then the starting point is you actually calculate your correlation coefficients as rank correlation coefficients using Kendall's tau for every pair of variables. So um, if you imagine that you've got, say, um, 10 asset classes, well, in the same way that if you had 10 uh, cells of data for two asset classes, you'd have to do 45 calculations for Kendall's tau. Um, 10 asset classes means you're going to have 45 pairs of correlations that you need to look at. So again, it's going to be quite a large job. But anyway, you can calculate Kendall's tau for all those pairs of variables. And because it's a rank correlation coefficient, it doesn't depend on the degrees of freedom or even the copula that you're using. You can then use something called uh, Greiner's relation to estimate Pearson's row from Kendall's tau. And that is calculated as, um, you can see from this formula here, the sine of pi over 2 uh, times uh, the tau uh, between x and y. And, and the angle that you're calculating here uh, and applying the sine to is measured in radians, not degrees. So anybody like me that had a, an FX350 calculator in the 1980s, we switch the mode between, uh, what was it, deg, rad, and gra. This is essentially what it was for. So you could do things using radians. And if you want to know how far away uh, or what a confidence interval of your value of tau is, then there's an even more complicated formula from Escher, which allows you to work out what the variance of, of tau is. So y you can do something a little bit more robust than just calculating um, Pearson's row on stretched uh, or resh reshaped data. Um, this does, though, you know, it, it might kind of solve one problem, but it creates others. Because if you use anything other than observed correlations, so you use something like um, Griner's relation to work out what the correlations are, then you might end up with cor a correlation matrix which isn't positive, semi-definite. Um, and this essentially just means feasible, one which actually works in practice. Um, think about those 10 asset classes and the 45 pairs of correlations that you've got. Um, then there's a chance that not all of them are going to be consistent with each other. So, you know, for example, you've got three variables, A, B and C. Correlation between A and B is 90%. Correlation between B and C is 90%. The correlation between A and C cannot be minus 90%. It's just, it's just impossible. There is no set of data which, which will give you that. So, um, and the more correlations that you get, the bigger the matrix, the more likely you are to have some impossible combination hidden somewhere in there. 
Now, why is this important? Well, if you want to use a correlation matrix for simulation at all, then it's got to be positive semi-definite for, for the maths to work for, for Monte Carlo simulation. So it's quite, um, it's quite important that you do have the right sort of matrix. Um, and to get from a matrix which isn't positive semi-definite to one that is, it involves quite a bit of clever maths to be able to get to the nearest feasible uh, matrix. So just one more thing to worry about there. Um, even when you do have a correlation matrix for an elliptical copula, you've still got to determine the number of degrees of freedom. Now you could um, estimate the degrees of freedom from the coefficients of tail dependence. If you remember that formula we looked at um, before, uh, there was a number in there for the um, degrees of freedom in your T copula, and you could try to tweak that to make sure that it came up with a number for tail dependence which was consistent with what, what the data showed. Now this would work, I mean it's slightly suspect because you're only using the tails of the distribution so it's going to be um, less than perfect and also again you don't know how good these estimators are, you haven't got any uh, confidence intervals around them. So what this essentially means is that whilst parameterizing a copula is the final stage in the top-down approach is also often best used as the starting point for a bottom-up approach. And it also means that maybe method of moments isn't the best way of dealing with this. But uh, more on that next time. Um, and hopefully this has been uh, interesting and useful. Uh, if you do have comments and questions, please um, put them in the comments and I'll uh, try and answer uh, any of those that I know the answers to um, and uh, make sure that you um, like, comment, subscribe etc and I shall see you next time.